I don't know what you teach your students at the moment on Brexit or the parallel between Brexit and economics. There's so many worries out there about negative yes. rates, monetary policy. Yes. What world will we see in 12 months? Well, of course, the, the, the worst thing you could do is to bring in even a bigger uncertainty on top of what you, you've just mentioned, which is Brexit, because we've had the uncertainty for three years now, um, but it's getting worse. And you ask me, what, what do we see to have? months from now, I don't know, maybe we'll still be applying for postponement of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of Brexit, who knows, but um, the, the, the worst thing of all really, and, and, and it really um, hits you when you come to a place like the European House and Rossetti, where there's so much enthusiasm for what the European Union is doing across so many different dimensions, you know, I've just been in a meeting where uh, they were discussing the new trade agreements with ASEAN uh, countries, with uh, Singapore, Vietnam, Japan. And you think, if, if there is a hard Brexit, if we, if we just walk out on the 31st of October, do we lose all these free trade agreements? Do we suddenly say, oh, you know, all trade with, uh, with Japan, with Singapore, is now, will now be subject to WTO rules, uh, the, World, the World Trade Organization, where we have to check rules of origin and, and product descriptions and all that? It, 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 it's a complete disaster for companies. Uh, trying to find their way in this very complicated wo uh, uh, world. But, so that could be a shock. You also have the U.S.-China trade war. Yes, exactly. Do we exactly. understand all the linkages, right? Is, is, is the biggest concern that we have is actually the unintended consequences, I guess, of maybe monetary policy dealing with political shock events? Well, you see, I mean, we have the U.S.-China trade war. Um, we, we, we've had very interesting discussions where we don't really understand where it's going. You know, trade war is a, is a 1970s uh, feature. Now we have tech wars, which are far more important. There is digital technology, there is big data, there is confidenti confidentiality. The, 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 I mean, there is politics involved, central banks trying to find their ways around, but more importantly, the European Union is uh, ahead everyone else in the regulation of the new technologies, it, uh, how, how we deal with privacy. Is, is trying very carefully to balance, um, find a balanced uh, way, a balanced view in between the two mega economies of the world. And, and when you put it all together, it's, a, it's an economy of five, 500 million people. It's about the size of the United States and, uh, and a little bit bigger than China. Then it, it's got gravitas. It, yeah. it can talk internationally. It, it, it can push ahead with this regulation. And, What's little Britain going to do when, it's, when, it's, when it, it, it gets out of there? How is it going to deal with this situation? Yeah. Where is it going to sit? But Europe also has huge problems. I mean, they probably, you know, we're seeing a technical recession in Germany. We're seeing a technical recession in Italy. Mm. I, what does Europe need to do to, to try and avoid a real recession, right? A, a prolonged downturn. Is it fiscal spending? And are we ever going to get something that's substantial enough? I, I, I think what it needs to do is... Uh, is new in infrastructure directed to the digital economy. The future is digital, there's no doubt about that. You know, um, we, we have to push ahead with the greener energies because the environment and the GDPR on, on privacy are all these things that companies have to adapt there. They need the infrastructure, they need the knowledge. Um, fiscal policy has a big role to play. I'm against the idea of uh, of fiscal surpluses, especially on some countries or completely balanced budgets when you spend on infrastructure, there's a rate of return in the future that can repay what you need to do it. We have a very high level of education, we have a high level of, of research outputs we need to get together as a, as a continent and see what's needed in the in the artificial intelligence and digital dimension, and, and we do need a, a, a lot there. But so do, do economists, and actually do, do markets, does anyone really understand what's going on in the economy, g given the shifts that you've just discussed? Well, uh, I mean, do we ever understand precisely what's happening? You know, we, we think we understand, and suddenly we get hit by a complete downturn, like 2008, and, and it takes us all by surprise. We don't know. Fingers crossed we're not going to get into that situation. but. The, the idea is to work together and try and understand what's going on across all, all dimensions. You know, the medical sector is becoming important with our agent societies. We could use artificial intelligence there. It, it, economists need to get together with scientists and uh, other 
market practitioners and, and work together and, and do the pure science in the uh, ivory towers will not get you very far because you need to adapt your technology to the conditions of the economy in which you're operating. And, and to do that, you, you, you do need to have uh, open borders and co collaboration with each other. But why is inflation so stubbornly low? I mean, in Europe, have we gotten the risk? Have we gotten yeah. rid of the risk of deflation? Or is it still mm. simmering? Well, in, in, in my view, again, we, we got risk, rid of the risk of severe deflation, but I wish we had some more inflation because a, a little bit of inflation, you know, the old fashioned expression, it's, it, it oils the uh, engine of, of economic growth. Um, why we're not getting well? We don't have the fiscal deficits anymore that were the cause of inflation. Um, we're more uh, open as, as economies and um, and and there is foreign competition that is keeping prices low. Uh, labor is becoming less important. Wages are becoming less important in, um, in production. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a good development because it's been shifting, rates of return have been shifting to capital and labor and that's been increasing inequality. Mm -hmm. But that, inevi that inevitably keeps prices low because you don't have this sort of cost plus pricing that we used to have But are you, do you worry that Europe is becoming like Japan? And, and, and how much would that be a concern? Well, it, it, it will worry me a lot if it became like Japan, and it, and, and it could if we don't handle it uh, well. But I, I, I don't think it's a real risk, though. I don't think so. I, I, you see, because what, what you also have to remember is that, um, is that in, in Europe doesn't put as much emphasis on, on the pure economic growth, the pure number in the way they do in China and even the United States. It, it has other concerns as well, environmental, the social state, uh, how to deal with the uh, state health, state supported health, um, the GDPR again that, that, mm -hmm. that, that I mentioned before, you know, the privacy things. And, they, and those things inevitably, they um, take away some of your potential uh, pure economic growth. So even if I see 1% growth, less than 1% growth, if, if I see the other broader measures of uh, of, of well-being and, uh, and and development, then then I say you know th th this is good, it's satisfactory. It, it's a better way of dealing with it. In fact, in fact, look at uh, you know look at the happiness in this is that you see more and more of that the ranks in European nations are on top. You know, United States is, is, is way below. I mean, yeah. they, they, this kind of push just for pure uh, growth in the value of goods that you produce and you ignore everything else, it's, it, it's a very old-fashioned idea. It's not where we want to be given our standard of living.